Welcome to a weekly review of North Dakota's legislative news. Now, here's your host, Dave Thompson, with North Dakota Legislative Review. And with North Dakota Legislative Review, I'm Dave Thompson. The governor's first veto of the 2019 legislative session has been upheld. Now, the bill would have expanded uh, license fees for driver's licenses from $15 to $30, $30, double it. The Senate decided to override the veto. House, however, upheld the veto. One of the other things that happened is that we saw more action on expanding the Board of Higher Education. It would go from eight members to 15 members. It passed the Senate and then it was up in the House. It first failed in the House and it came back. It passed, but it was, it was amended, so now it goes back to the Senate for further discussion. And one other thing, the House and Senate have now agreed to a pay plan for state employees for the next two years. They get 2% two raise, two raises in the first year, 2.5% raises in the second year. In the first year, it's a minimum of $120 a month and a maximum of $200 a month. And by approving this, legislative leaders are now saying this could end the legislative session a little bit earlier. And we are now joined by State Senator Erin Oban of Bismarck. She's a Democrat. Senator, thank you for being here. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. You're on Education Committee, mm -hmm. and we just talked about an education bill, and that's that expanding the Board of Higher Education. You know, there was a two-board bill that failed in the House earlier. Yep. There was a three-board bill that came from the task force. Right. Where do you come down on that? So. Uh I was not sure that I could entertain the idea of having separate boards because I think we're supposed to have a unified system. And I, I didn't feel that that would um, create the, the unity that we want in our university system across North Dakota. Um, so I did support the expansion of the board because I've seen uh, the pressures that are put on voluntary, you know, volunteers as board members. Um, and I thought if we could add a few people to that board, um, spread out the work a little bit, maybe allow them to work in committees, um, which I know some of them would like to be able to do to create more focus on specific initiatives or on um, whether it's our four-year, our two-year um, colleges and universities that will allow them to do that. One thing the students are asking for another full-time board member. They have one, yeah. that's a voting member. They like to go to two, if you, especially if you're going to have these subcommittees. One that's going to look at the university, sure. uh, the research universities, one that's going to look at the four-year schools, one that's going to look at the two-year schools. How do you feel about a second student member? To me, it makes sense to at least entertain that idea. If you're nearly doubling the size of the board, it might make sense to make sure that that student voice is represented in the same proportion as we have now. Um, I, I also know how difficult it is to be a new board member. And if that term is shorter for a student, it, it takes longer to sort of find your legs in those, in those positions. So I think it will be a worthy discussion. Um, whether or not it comes out in the end to add a student member, I think is yet to be determined. But it's, it's, a, it's an important discussion to have. And actually one I brought up um, in committee when we were discussing it the first time. So you, you've already talked about it in committee? Then. We discussed it and just decided we would see how, how we could do with increasing the size of the board. Um, I know that was a, a little harder sell over in the House. And now that it's coming back and we'll go into conference committee, I'm sure that will be a discussion between both chambers. There at least seems to be some uh, recognition among legislators that the current system does need to be tweaked somehow. And I, don't, I always believe that governance is as good as the people governing. Um, so I have a hard time believing that big changes need to be made just to make sure that, that our system is as, as quality as students and families and taxpayers demand that it should be. Um, so providing an opportunity to spread out some of that work, I think, again, that we, that we ask for volunteer board members to have is, is, in my opinion, a better way to do it than, than kind of uprooting the whole system. Now, one of the things that's been a priority of legislators for time immemorial, at least for the number of sessions I've been covering it, is spending on K-12 education. Mm -hmm. Status seems like it's in pretty good shape now. I think it's settled right now around two and two. Um, I've made it clear that I would prefer closer to three and three. Um, not, because, not just because I think it's what schools need, especially after going for a biennium without an increase at all, uh, but also because that is direct property tax relief. And when everybody I've heard, whether it's right here in my district or across the entire state, the only complaints I've ever heard about taxes in North Dakota are about property taxes. When the state decided to take on a bigger share of funding K-12 education, um, that was a real way to provide property tax relief. And it's also a way to make sure 
that we continue to maintain um, that equity and, um, and adequacy in funding K-12 education. But your point about what happened two years ago, K-12 was held harmless, but because there were no increases, it was I just held harmless. held harmless. That was the, yeah. the cases that right. they were actually behind. Right, and we also had to dip into basically the reserves that kept K-12 education whole. And so not only you know did they not get an increase, but they would have been cut with the governor's allotments had we not had that fund um, available. And, and we were able to access that because the, pub the public told us on the ballot that we could um, to, to hold K-12 education harmless. Really what it comes down to for me, kids have nothing to do with the budget decisions that are being made in Bismarck. And um, it, you know I really think we have some catching up to do. And, and I'm, I'm fairly in tune with the challenges that, that schools are trying to meet and that administrators are trying to meet and school boards are trying to meet with finding that right balance between what schools need and what taxpayers um, want, so. Well, you brought up two and two, and I have to ask about the pay plan mm -hmm. because Democrats supported three and three. We did. The House was at two and two, the Senate was at two and three, the governor was at four and two. <laughs> None of that makes makes any difference now because it is a two and a two and a half percent mm -hmm. that apparently House and Senate have pretty much a reached agreement on, plus these minimums. Right, and, and I think that's the the big difference for for me with being able to be more um, amenable to the two and two and a half is making sure that that minimum is in there. That makes sure that the lower income folks, um, the lower earners who are working for the state, get an increase that sometimes is going to be higher than two or two and a half percent. Uh, and that's really important when we're talking about cost of living adjustments and just being able to make sure that we're paying people uh, a living wage and one that can, can continue to be competitive with the, the private sector. And I hear from the state employees groups that they, they like this concept because of that, because of that floor especially. Right, right. I think that floor is important and to make sure it gets in the, in the right hands of the, the employees. It doesn't get stuck up in administration somewhere. I don't want to get too, too far <laughs> deep in the weeds, but one other thing, one other thing in this pay plan mm -hmm. is that state uh, agencies will be allowed to roll up for raises at the higher end to, about, to address compression issues, to address retention issues. And that, that's been a major issue mm -hmm. over the last several bienniums is retaining. You know, you keep and retain good, right. good employees. Right. Uh, I know that there's been some resistance to roll-ups, but now there seems to be a lot more, uh, shall we say, acceptance of that. Yeah, and uh, again, I think that's, that's why um, making sure that that minimum maximum language is in there. You also have been blessed to be on the Ethics Committee in the Senate. <laughs> Blessing and a curse. <laughs> yes, and of course, those bills are still pending out yeah. there, and it appears that the House is going to hold on to the Senate Ethics Bill until the Senate takes action on the House Ethics Bill, and you know there are some differences there. If you had your druthers, and again, without going too far in the weeds, because that's, that's really a complicated yeah, issue, is, it is. what would you like to see? What I would like to see is as close to the Senate bill that we passed out unanimously, I believe, out of the Senate chamber. Um, that's not how the House bill came out of the House chamber. And when you can get you know, far-right Republicans and, and far-left Democrats, and everybody in between to unanimously support the Senate bill and, and a lot of contention with the House bill, the closer we can get to, to the Senate bill, of course, that's going to be my preference. And I think it really was, um, it, it was in, the, in the, um, the intent of the sponsors of the measure and of the people who passed it. Um, that to me is our job, is to implement what the people passed, no matter anybody's personal feelings on it, that is our job. And I think the Senate bill comes closer to doing that. And there is some room for implementation, but there is also some authority by the commission that's going to be appointed. Right, and, and, and I think that's kind of the fundamental difference between the House and Senate bill is when the measure was passed and is now Article 14 in the Constitution, it, it creates an ethics commission. And the Senate's position was that the ethics commission should be the one um, kind of writing the rules and coming up with the, the um, the enforcement of some of those, some of the language that was passed. Uh, I think the House would, would insert the legislature into more of that. And um, it's my opinion that, that the goal of that ethics commission is to, to not play favorites anywhere, so. Plus uh, there is a study, at least I think still in the Senate bill, there was an uh, interim study. Uh, I think in the Senate bill, we removed that study we because okay. there, were, there were groups coming to the table saying, we don't want to kick this can down the road two years. We want to know what the rules are. And the Senate decided, let's, let's have the Ethics Commission create those rules then. 
uh, Senator Hogue, your chair, said that mm -hmm. he would not be opposed to an interim study, not to change it, but to go out and explain to everybody what the rules are of sure, the rule are. Sure, so. uh, That will be important regardless. And, uh, you know, Senator Mathern and I, who sit on the Ethics Commission er, Committee together, we're advocating for that interim study. Um, wh whatever that, dis that study does maybe is yet to be determined, but I do think that it is a good way to try to bring people together and get people on the same page. Since it was an initiated constitutional measure, your other committee did take a look on, on a number of measures mm -hmm. that changes the rules for constitutional right. measures. Not very many have fared very well. What do you think is going to come out of the session? You know, maybe not very many have fared very well, but there have been so many introduced that I think whatever has moved forward uh, is, it, is going to be a significant change compared to what we've seen in the last hundred years, essentially. Um, the, the constitutional amending process, you know, frankly, the legislature puts way more on the ballot to amend the Constitution than the people do. And so I have a hard time believing that, that there is so much um, injustice being done to the constitutional amending process that we, the legislature, has to take the authority to, to put that on the ballot for the people to decide. And I just said this in committee today. If the people felt that the constitutional amending process was broken, they would be initiating a constitutional amendment to change it. And I haven't heard that outcry from the public. I've heard that outcry from legislators. I haven't heard that from the public. There, you don't see any uh, legs, so to speak, on going to 60 percent. Oh, I think there are room. legs. I think there, there are, are some legs I on think that. there are legs. So there, again, this kind of these games that happen at the end of session are happening in both chambers. Um, there are a couple bills still left over in the Senate, and there are a couple bills, at least one bill over in the House. Um, one of them would require the legislature to approve any constitutional amendment that the people approve before that can become law. And um, another would increase that threshold to 60%. Um, there was one suggestion I could sort of get on board with, and that was m ha making sure that all constitutional amendments would be on the general election bat ballot. Um, it makes sense to me that we would want those, those measures being, being uh, voted on by the majority of voters who show up to the polls. Um, but when you're talking about changing signatures, changing thresholds for passage, um, changing timelines, I, I just I, I think those are ways that, that do limit the public's ability um, to initiate their own changes. And it's almost sacred in North Dakota. We've had that it is. on the books it for is. a long, long right. time. Right. Uh, and the majority of those complaints that I'm hearing have happened in the last 10 years, not in the last, not in the previous 90. So to me, the problems are not with the process. And just thinking about what you say about as they get toward the end of session, things get a little dicey mm -hmm. in terms of, oh, germaneness and thing like yeah. that. Something happened today I just wanted to get your reaction to. Um, Representative Hedlund had that bill to yep. take up part of the <laughs> legacy fund mm -hmm. and reduce income taxes eventually right. to zero. That failed in the Senate. Pretty resoundly. Now, now it's mm -hmm. back as an amendment to the tax commissioner's mm -hmm. budget bill. So they're going to try another bite at the apple. Was that something you can support? So one, I think uh, kudos to the press for covering these kinds of things because I think it shows people what's happening in these last 15 to 20 days. Um, absolutely not. It's not something I'm going to support under any way, shape, or form. Um, again, the complaints that I've heard from North Dakotans on taxes is always about property taxes. But in the end, I believe in the three-legged stool. And when one of those gets completely out of whack, one of those other legs is going to have to pick up the pick up the shortage. Um, in, in my opinion, our, our legs are already a little out of balance um, with regard to income tax, and the elimination of that uh, would be so short-sighted, in my opinion, and certainly not in line with what the public um, put the legacy fund in place for. And since it's legacy fund, uh, one leg of the stool could get a lot larger because it relies on that oil tax yeah. money, and that's a that's a commodity, and commodities are a little bit if we haven't at times. If we haven't seen what happens when we rely too much on the volatility of commo commodity prices already, we haven't learned our lesson. I would like to get your opinion about uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Library, mm -hmm. which apparently might be coming back somewhere. <laughs> uh, it's not in the Commerce Bill, at least the, the Senate right now, mm -hmm. and it might be on the OMB bill toward the end, you know, the old catch-all bill yeah. or the Christmas tree bill, whatever you want to call it. But apparently there seems to be some movement that something needs to be done. Mm -hmm. What do you feel? Well, I, I think the premise of your question when you said something needs to be done is 
different than maybe wants to be done. I, I see that as a want and not as a need. Um, I, I certain I, I can understand why uh, the governor has proposed this as a as a um, maybe an appropriate way of using legacy funds. Um, but I'm struggling a little bit to to figure out if this is worthy of um, public funds, especially at a time when we are just just coming back from some really tough budget cuts that affected people um, to determine if building um, a library and museum out in Western North Dakota is something that, it, that North Dakotans want. Ultimately, that's what I want to know is this, if this is what North Dakotans want, um, you know, we can debate what the best way to fund that is um, and how much that is. Uh, but I, I haven't been convinced yet. Something that might be worth study, perhaps, or? Sure, I, I, I think that's part of um, the challenge is that this was kind of sprung on us. And, and maybe, you know, the element of surprise was sort of, <laughs> sort of the governor's goal, I don't know. Um, you know, I do, I think that Governor Burgum is a visionary guy. I, I just don't know if this was the right approach to actually get something done. Um, without bringing people together, I don't know how the people out in the Medora area feel. Um, how is this going to impact the infrastructure that they would have to uphold if actually the number of people that the governor's office has said would visit would come out there? Um, are the roads sustainable? Is the water and sewer able to, to sustain that? Um, those are real questions that I think we need to ask ourselves before we would um, approve something going, going forward. Since you mentioned surprise, I have to go back to the other big surprise that a lot of people said they didn't see coming. This idea of moving the prisoners mm -hmm. out of New England mm -hmm. to Bismarck and the Bismarck prisoners to Jamestown mm -hmm. and building a new state hospital. That whole thing maybe moved into a study or something mm -hmm. like that. I haven't heard too much about it, but um, when you saw that, you th what was your thought? My thought was, um, I will hear out the arguments. If that is what's best for the population they serve, maybe, maybe it's worthy of considering. What I can't support is putting more money into buildings to house people rather than investing on the front end to try to prevent things. I think we are always playing catch up and that is not a good way to spend resources and or affect lives. The more money we put in on the front end to prevent these issues from happening, the better we are going to be as a state. And so I, I would have a hard time supporting the building of a new facility. It seems like that view about putting money in the front end for mm -hmm. prevention is gaining a lot of traction. Yeah, we've done some really good, important um, initiatives and funding those initiatives in behavioral health, and I hope that sticks through the time we gavel out and leave town. Well, you were around for the Schulte Report. You were that was done a little bit before I was elected, yeah. um, but obviously it's something I'm interested in and have followed and support. Um, when we as a legislature do studies and find out information that can show how we can better impact these decisions, we should follow those reports and those studies. And we've been a little, we've been dragging our feet a little bit. I would suggest this session we've done more um, than we've even done before. There are people who said, yeah, the, it's a really good start, mm -hmm. but there is a lot more to do. And especially if you're thinking about treatment uh, facilities and, and treatment personnel mm -hmm. west of the, west, in West River country. You know, you're west of right. Highway 83. Right. And you know I grew up in a really small town up in northwest North Dakota. I know that access to many of those kinds of services is challenging all across North Dakota, but especially in, in um, rural western North Dakota where there just aren't a lot of, um, of the right personnel. And so the more we can do to invest in making sure that people have the services and programs they need to be healthy contributing citizens, um, the better all of our communities are going to be. I want to go back to the the three three two two for just a second because when the Senate Appropriations Committee originally proposed, proposed two and three, that would include the increases for like nursing homes, mm -hmm. DD but providers, DD providers, right. and things mm -hmm. like that. I'm not exactly sure where that is at. I don't know if it's two and two and a half, or they're two and three, or they're trying to get to three and three. It, you know, that's that's a question I'm going to be following following our appropriators with to make sure, you know, we get updates every day on what's coming out. And I think we all sort of sighed a bit of a relief when, when we were able to s kind of settle in on, on uh, public employee salaries. A and now I think that's going to be that next big one is making sure that the increases to long-term care, to DD providers um, are, are sufficient to meet, again, not only 
um, no increase, but cuts as well that, that happened previously. And we have just a few moments left. I wanted to get your take on this ERA resolution, which did finally <laughs> die. <laughs> and we've finally got a hold of the vote that it was 24-23 mm -hmm. against. And that was, that was interesting. That, that was interesting. We will say that. I, I, I find those kinds of things um, to distract from the real issues that we need to be talking about. Um, when North Dakota chose to ratify the ERA all those years ago, what happens beyond that is, you know, is really nothing we can control. And, and this was already sort of decided by the people of North Dakota. And to, to kind of dig this back up, um, my colleague on the floor that carried it said it best. I think this just serves to give us a black eye and, and it doesn't do us any good. Well, Senator, thank you very much for taking the time to be thank here. Thank you, Dave. Today. Appreciate being here. Our guest, Senator Aaron Alabama of Bismarck, she's a Democrat. Well, it took two tries, but the House has finally approved changes to the State Board of Higher Education. It would also mean changing the state constitution. But as political correspondent Chad Mira tells us, a member of the task force created to study the idea is not pleased with what was passed. For an entire year, a task force of primarily lawmakers and educators studied the idea of changing the current structure of the State Board of Higher Education. As it is right now, we have institutions that have never had um, a member on the State Board of Higher Ed who represents their constituency. Representative Shannon Roars Jones was on the task force. From, uh, from almost the first couple of meetings that we had, we decided that this, the current system was not working and that we should explore something different. In a final report, they recommended creating a new three board system. Having boards that were more specifically aligned to the missions of the institutions that they were overseeing uh, would be more beneficial. But lawmakers rejected a multi-board system, instead opting for expanding the current board from 8 to 15 members. Representative Mike Nathy was also on the task force. I do think the current one-board system, since the multi-board system had failed earlier, was a good fallback position and uh, I think it was a good compromise. Others on the task force disagree. Moving it from eight members to 15 members, um, we've, we've essentially just taken a broken system and doubled it. But Nathy said this change would still have benefits. I know some of the current concerns are the board might be too big, but we found in our discussions that the current size of the board now, the members are absolutely overloaded with the work. Either way, since it involves changing the constitution, it'll now be up to the voters. Well, Governor Doug Burgum also released a statement on the change. He says, quoting now, I cannot support the resolution as passed. While incorporating some of the task force's recommendations, this resolution does not substantially improve the governance structure originally created 80 years ago, but rather nearly doubles the size of the existing board and expects different results. And I'm joined now by Chad Mira, our okay. legislative correspondent. Chad. We are now truly in the third period of the three-period <laughs> hockey game there. with the conference committees being appointed. Mm -hmm. Are there specific things that you're looking at next week? Well, you know, we were talking last week, like one of the sticky wickets we thought would be that state employee raises. However, it seems like we got that ironed out. But you did have a very good conversation with Senator Oban about the uh, Ethics Commission now, and there's still a lot of differences to be ironed out between those two bills. Of course, we know there, there's a... a House bill, uh, Republican House bill, and then the Democratic Senate bill. That one was passed unanimously in the Senate. But they do have quite a few differences. Some amendments have been made to the House bill. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Rich Warner, though, hinting we might end up having to kind of mix and match the two together before we're all done. You know, funny thing is that's, that's what I was thought, thinking was going to happen with these two. They'll take parts of A, parts of B, and come together with a C that, that can pass both houses. Yeah, and the, the people behind the initiative measure uh, they are in large support of the Senate version, the Democratic version of this bill. Uh, the problem with the House bill is that they didn't believe that it set strict enough uh, penalties for starters. When it could, they want to, you know, restrict lobbying, create this ethics commission. They want to make sure that it has strong funding as well as uh, stricter penalties, penalties that are significant enough to deter uh, what, what they might view as ethical violations. Now, you, I you don't know if you heard the question I asked, and that's we just found out about this uh, tax relief bill that is now back on another bill. Mm -hmm. It's in the tax commissioner's bill as an amendment. So it, they're take, taking another bite at the apple. Do you think there's going to be a lot of discussion on that? Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say. I, like you said, it's kind of kind of been kicked around a little bit earlier in the session already. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. A couple of the lawmakers I've talked to 
had the same concerns that Senator Oban has expressed about taking away one of those legs of the three-legged stool, so to speak. So we'll have to see if uh, any feelings change moving forward. Now, I, I, I was noticing something that happened very recently, too. There was a debate in the House floor. There was a, a, a study put on one of the uh, bills to help the retirement plan to, again, study looking at going to a defined contribution plan and ending the defined benefit plan. I know that's been a controversial issue for a number of years. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Are we going to see a lot of action on that, perhaps? We'll see. There's still a lot of things that, you know, they're trying to get to. So it's hard to say. I haven't been following that one too, per too closely, personally, myself. But, of course, the uh, library, Theodore Roosevelt Library Museum is that's, still hanging out there somewhere. That's still, the whether it be the library or just, just uh, any idea in general of how they're going to spend the legacy fund earnings. I know there's still a lot of debate about uh, what to do with that money, as Senator Beckadall has said in the past to us. You know, you have, a, you have a 141 lawmakers and 141 ideas on what to do with that legacy fund. A little tip for you, watch the legacy fund. There will be a bill introduced, but they're not calling it buckets. They're calling it silos. Oh, we're so going thought, away from the buckets. We're going away from the okay. buckets now. So. <laughs> thank you, Chad. Thanks, Dave. And thank you for watching and listening to North Dakota Legislative Review.